Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, a webinar on harmonized standards under the Machine Learning Directive. You are many to have registered for this webinar, so thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Els, and I will be moderating this webinar in the background together with a few of my colleagues. Um, as usual, all participants to the webinar are muted. We can see that on the next slide, you have the possibility to enter your questions in the Q&A panel of the webinar. Uh, that means that the speakers will have a look at your questions during the presentations that are ongoing. We have also foreseen for each speaker uh, a Q&A moment at the end of the presentation so we can uh, pick up your questions um, as soon as possible. Should your question remain unreplied, please don't worry because we intend to create a Q&A report that will be made available via the Sunsunlec website uh, later on. Um, we also intend to share with you the presentation that will be shown today, as well as the complete recording of this webinar. So feel free to um, share that with any colleague or person that is interested in machinery directive, of course, um, so that the word is spread. Uh, should you be on Twitter, feel free to tweet about this webinar. We are uh, at standards for eu and you can use the hashtag training for standards. So without further ado, let me maybe open the next slide there where you have the, the full agenda for today. I'm not going to go into detail, but we plan to go through these presentations one by one. And as I said, with a Q&A moment, sorry, after each presentation. So let me uh, give the floor now to our first speaker. We have the pleasure to uh, have today uh, Dr. Gerhard Steiger, who is the Sense and Elect Sector Rapporteur on Machinery. So we will see that on the next slide, please. Uh, and Dr. Steiger will uh, talk about the uh, risk assessment and a basic approach with reference to ENISO 12100 and the SEN guide 414. So please, Dr. Steiger, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Els. Um, it's a pleasure for me to uh, present today some of the basic documents uh, which were developed uh, in support of machinery safety standardization with regard to um, the machinery directive uh, supporting uh, this piece of legislation by harmonized standard. Next slide, please. As you could see um, on the very rare number 292, the activities started very early uh, in this field together with the first edition of the machinery directive in the early 90s. And uh, during this time, a group of um, uh, experts mainly from Germany, France, and um, UK developed the uh, EN 292 series, which is really the basis of all our work. Um, this is, um, was, was complemented by EN 1050, which was a European standard uh, on the principles of risk assessment. And all these uh, three standards are more or less the introduction or the translation of uh, the requirements of the machinery directive to the uh, language of the standardizers or the language of the machine manufacturers, let's say this way, because um, it, is, it was necessary or what seemed necessary to, to make such an, a transposition. Over the years, um, our whole work was more and more internationalized. Uh, you know, also the, um, the markets were more international and uh, we have a big and strong European uh, sector for machinery. And we reached them out to the international arena and we transposed 292 um, in early uh, 20s. Uh, to the uh, international arena by two standards, ENISO 12100 part one and two. And we, we did the same with the risk assessment standard, uh, which became ENISO 14121. The final uh, evaluation step was then the uh, revision of uh, all these three ENISO standards we put together um, all three standards in, in one document, and this is the now existing ENISO 12100 from uh, 2010. And um, in addition to that, we have a technical report in ISO, which is providing some practical guidance and examples for risk assessment, which is ISO TR 14121-2. Sorry, there's a slight mistake in the, in the presentation here. Okay, 
Next slide, please. And um, from this development, you could see we were rather successful to implement our European approach in the international arena. And one of the basic uh, achievements was also to introduce the um, um, structure of machinery safety standards, which we have with the type A standards, which is basically now only EN ISO 12100, which is providing basic um, concepts, principles for design and ASTEC that could be applied uh, across all machinery. Then um, the so-called type B standards, which are generic safety standards dealing with one safety aspect or one type of safeguard. For example, if you're dealing with hot surfaces of machinery, you have such a type B standard, or if you are dealing with uh, um, some kind of um, uh, safety safeguards, for, for example, um, the, um, um, for, for certain uh, guards, uh, which has to be considered um, in, the, in the machinery safety field, you will find those type B standards altogether. It's round about uh, 100 type B standards we have already available. And finally, we have the type C standards. That's the big uh, amount of standards we have available that are the machine specific safety standards dealing with the detailed safety requirement or with uh, requirements for a particular machine or group of machines. And here we have uh, in the meantime, round about 700 standards available with a growing number of standards, which are also uh, developed in ISO. And we have taken it over then uh, on European level via the Vienna Agreement. Next slide, please. Here you could see um, that um, we had a particular a part of EN ISO 12100, which is dealing with risk assessment and risk reduction. This picture shows more or less the um, risk assessment part um, more in detail. Here you have, of course, first uh, of all to determine the limits of the machinery, what you are considering. Then you have to um, identify the uh, corresponding hazards. You have then to uh, estimate the risk which are related to these hazards. And then you have to, to evaluate um, and you have to decide uh, if that what you have already uh, in your design, is this adequately reducing existing risks or do you have to do some uh, risk uh, reduction measures? And this will be then more explained on the next page. But I want really to um, uh, point out here the most uh, important steps are really the one highlighted in yellow, because if you're not doing this in a very success, uh, exact way, then, then uh, of course, um, your standard could be challenged afterwards. The estimation and evaluation, uh, especially the esti esti estimation is a kind of a subjective uh, um, measure. And this, of course, must be done in a certain way. But uh, this could not be, um, is not really the most important one. And if you are concentrating on the other ones, I think this is, is key. The next slide, please. You could see in detail uh, with the flow chart um, how you should then do um, the uh, risk reduction. Uh, the, the first step, uh, and this is the preferred one, according to the hierarchy given in the machinery, is to uh, try to implement inherently safe design measures. That means you're designing your machinery in a way that no uh, hazards exists. Um, and then, of course, you must not reduce something uh, later on. Uh, the second uh, is really the risk reduction by guards and protective devices. <clears throat> if part one or step one is not possible, you have to go through the this, this second part. Um, and finally, uh, for remaining risk where step one and step two are not feasible or possible, you have then to inform the user about the um, remaining risks uh, in the information for use. And this is more or less a kind of a iterative process which have to go through uh, to, to come then to the final result, a tolerable risk at the end for the use of the machinery. 
Next slide, please. All this, of course, is not only uh, a singular task for the machine manufacturer, of course, that what is prescribed in the machinery directive, this is related only to the machine manufacturer, but uh, in reality, um, it has to be done also in a kind of uh, interaction with the user. The user gets the information for use where the remaining risks are prescribed and some uh, warning signs and warning uh, devices are explained, uh, which are important for the use of the machinery. Uh, but um, the designer, of course, did not know in each case uh, how the machinery is really used in, in practice. And this is then the task of the machinery user. And you could see here that there is a kind of um, user input also to the machine manufacturer. And this could be done, of course, also in the uh, standardization where uh, in case machine users are um, participating, they could give their experience back for the standardization too and, and could by this way improve the standard uh, content. Okay, next slide, please. Over the years, we have uh, developed also a kind of um, set of technical reports in uh, for supporting the, the whole system. And one which is really important is the uh, ISO TR 20100-1. This is also available as a SEN TR, identically, more or less. And here we are explaining um, to the machine manufacturer how to use our system as, as, as such. Because you could imagine not for each uh, kind of machinery, a type C standard would be available and not each type C standard is exactly covering the potential of risk on a machinery. For, for our field, we are very diversified. We have a lot of machinery, purpose-made machinery of course, you need some additional help. And this was done by this document. Of course, it had not so much to do with the standardization as such, but we feel it necessary that uh, we have such a document to explain our system also to the machine uh, manufacturers that they could really uh, use it in an effective way. Next slide, please. Now I want to jump to Zen Guide 414. Zen Guide 414 is um, the, the guide um, which was, um, you see it from the name, was developed based on uh, 12100 uh, on the Zen side of the system to um, develop safety standards. It provides rules for the drafting and presentation of safety standards. Uh, the main content uh, are general principles, uh, mandatory provisions, uh, and provisions with added value. That means um, what has to be considered uh, for the um, um, development of a type C and a type B standard. Mainly, it is really um, focusing on type C standards. And it is providing also some principles to be considered during the drafting process. Uh, it gives also some hint for the format of the safety standards and has some annex even with some um, uh, text proposals for the three language version of uh, such a safety standard. Okay, please go to the next page. I think in line with that, what um, is also uh, written in the machinery directive, um, one of the principles is that the type C standards should deal as far as possible with all safe, significant hazards. Um, considering one type of machine or one group of machines, preferably in, in one standard. And um, of course, it is a kind of um, request, but for some reason, it could also be the case that it would be uh, sensible to uh, addressing only one aspect for um, particular machinery for, for one particular uh, safety issue. For example, if you want to deal with the braking capability of a, of a mobile machinery, you could also to do this in a separate standard. It depends also a little bit on the framework uh, 
existing uh, in, the, in the standardization uh, environment, for example, at international level, if something exists already on that, um, it is worthwhile to, to have this also in a separate way uh, at European level. But then, of course, in a type C standards for a machine group, this should be then used uh, uh, as, as basis and as input for the standard. And, and how to develop now the standard? Um, we, we have developed this type A, B, and C system. And of course, it makes sense if you first check uh, if relevant or applicable type B standards are available, which could be used as normative reference. And this is the first option. You could, of course, also make reference to other type C standards, which are similar and addressing uh, certain aspects in an very good way and you must not reinvent the wheel uh, for, for those aspects and then you could make reference on those standards. And um, what of course will happen is that you make uh, your own safety specifications in the standard. Um, and um, this is of course then done um, um, on the basis of, or I would not say on the basis, but considering this risk assessment aspects that uh, I have shown uh, before. What is also important um, for the future development uh, within the, the sector of technology is that you try to um, specify requirements uh, in an objective way rather than in a design prescriptive way, because this is of course um, creating obstacles for, for further developments. Uh, it's not always easy and um, sometimes uh, TCs tend to um, using those design requirements, um, but it should be rather used as an example and not, not as um, really a, as fixed requirement. Next slide, please. Similar to each other standard, you have certain clauses to be um, addressed in the standard. Of course, uh, the scope is very important. You have really tried to prescribe the limits of the machinery you are covering in your standard as, as precise as possible, because this is really um, important um, for the use later on that people really know what is covered by the standard and what not then you have to specify the significant hazards uh, which you are addressing. Um, this is um, with risk assessment that what is um, really to be very uh, essential. And only if you really have prescribed the hazards later on, you could make the link to the essential requirements of the machinery directive. Uh, without doing this, um, you will end up quickly in, in some problems and that's why we are recommending really to, to do this very uh, carefully and later on we will provide also some explanations how you could make the link between the significant hazards and the essential requirements. The major part of course of the uh, standardization is then the prescription of the protective or risk reduction measures um, which are necessary to uh, reduce the, the risks uh, to an acceptable level and of course uh, those uh, prescriptions must be verifiable um, it could happen that you are, have the, the verification already incorporated in the clause for the protective and risk reduction measures, or you could uh, deal this in a, with this in a separate uh, clause later on, but this is up to the um, TC how they want to do this. And finally, you have to um, specify the information for use. Next slide, please. I won't not go uh, very much in detail to this. This is more or less a kind of, of reminder what you have really uh, to do, but you have the Send Guide 414 uh, really available on Sun, Send Boss. You, you could really read it. It's um, really um, um, free of charge available. I want to go to the next slide. This is showing that um, we have also some kind of standard text provided. Um, in the um, um, in the Zen Guide 414, 
which are is essential and should be then used um, um, for all um, safety standards. And this would really create an uh, and consistent set of standards uh, in our view. And that's why we would really recommend to um, use, use those formulations as far as possible. And um, this, the current SEN guide also uh, have a uh, clause dealing with the Annex ZA, but uh, the SEN guide is from dated from 2017 that uh, shows that this um, requirements prescribed there or the, the guidance prescribed there could not be uh, according to the current state of the art here and adaptation is necessary. And um, I think uh, we will do this uh, in, in very short time that we uh, considering the newest requirement on the Annex ZA. Next slide, please. Here, a kind of screenshot where you could see that we have this um, texts uh, also translated from the English and the French and the German version. Uh, that means even if you make your translation in French or German, you could really use those standard texts uh, always uh, with, the, with the same wording that uh, increase the consistency. And next slide, please. Next slide, please. Oh, yeah. Okay, fine. Um, this is that what I have already mentioned. Um, the um, SEN guide 414 initially contained uh, an Annex D uh, where the uh, significant hazards were um, um, listed in a, in a table. And um, we have then created um, a kind of tool where these significant hazards were, um, um, where were linked from this significant hazard were made to the essential requirements of the, to the machinery directive. And, and using this kind of tool, you would be able to um, develop an initial detailed Annex ZA. Um, later on, uh, further presentations will give more information on that. Um, but very important is um, if you have a good list of significant hazards, then you could have also a good initial Annex ZA, but this is the prerequisite for, for using this tool. Okay, my last slide, please. Now uh, here you could see the tool, but I will not go over in detail. Colleagues later on will, will explain this more in detail. Final slide, please. I think we have already uh, at hand um, uh, some good guiding, guidance documents. And in the past, we had used SENGUIDE 414 even as a kind of mandatory guidance uh, document, uh, also in the interaction with the HUS consultants, and they have used SENGUIDE 414. And I think it would be worthwhile to think about to reintroduce SENGUIDE 414 for our current interaction with the HUS consultant system. And I think that could really create some potential to improve our work. Thank you for your attention and I would be happy to answer some of your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Steiger. Um, thank you for this interesting presentation. Um, there is one question in the Q&A panel at the moment. So I, uh, for those who joined during the, present, the first presentation of this webinar, I invite you to add your questions in the Q&A panel. Um, so um, I would just like to address the first question that we have. Uh, someone is wondering what applies when a harmonized standard makes normative reference to a non-harmonized standard. Dr. Steiger, can you clarify that? Yeah, I, I have already heard that those questions are around in the standardization committees, but according uh, to, to my knowledge, uh, it's perfectly possible to make an, an reference to uh, a non-referenced harmonized standard uh, in your list of normative references, because if this would be the case, it's like a hen egg problem. Um, at the beginning, we had no harmonized standard. And um, I think um, the understanding I have, and I, I hope that is also that what the commission has or the US system has it, that um, by um, making reference uh, to an 
standard, regardless if harmonized or not. Um, the content of this uh, normative reference will become the content of your standard, and then it's only uh, relevant to charge uh, if if the content is is correct and not what kind of status the standard has. Yeah? From that point of view, I think uh, it should be not a problem. And if it should be challenged by some has consultants, then of course I think it should be clarified. And but but we should maybe try to make this rather clear uh, that this this should be not a problem. Okay, thank you very much. That makes uh, sense indeed. A few other questions came in. Can you please have a look and, and maybe address one or more of them? We still have a few minutes to go for your part of the presentation. Somebody, for example, is asking if the non-harmonized standards mentioned will be assessed by the health consultant. Yeah, I, I could answer the two. Yeah, I think they have, of course, to, to consider the aspects you are referring to uh, in your normative reference also uh, in, in their assessment for your initial standard. Of course, because the, the requirements you are referring by a normative reference uh, will become more or less part of your standard. Okay, thank you. I'm still live. Yes, yes, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> a few more questions <laughs> you, are there. You, so... uh, should, should I uh, pick one or? Yes, yeah, so please go ahead. You can immediately pick one if you see one that is interesting um, to reply. Maybe um, one more easy one for Mr. Rodenborg. What does, what about reference to TS and TR documents? Are they allowed? Um, TR is normally providing only guidance. And, and from that point of view, it should not be a problem um, to make a reference to a TR, uh, but of course it could not be in relation to requirements of your standard. You could use this uh, to, to give some information, but it will not provide presumption of conformity, this part of your standard. 2TS, uh, I guess I, I would see this the same as for an EN or for an ENI. So um, if you are making a reference to a part of a TS, certainly not to the whole TS, um, but, but more to a part of a TS, uh, then um, in the assessment by the ASK consultant, it should be considered the same way as you're making reference to an um, EN. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, still time for one other? Yes, we have in fact still 10 minutes for your slot of the presentation, so okay. mm. um, we might take a few other one, ones. One which is more critical, which formal aspects for risk assessment are existing for working group developing a type C standard? Um, of course, we have to, to uh, consider that um, really the the benefit of standardization is compared to a risk assessment by a an, by an single manufacturer of a piece of equipment is that you have there together uh, a lot of knowledge from, from different fields, from uh, the manufacturer side, from test houses, from uh, health and safety organizations, sometimes even from the user side. And they should have, and they have, in the normal case, a lot of knowledge about uh, the intended use, the, the um, accident history, the possible uh, available risk reduction uh, measures. And of course, they are not starting uh, on a scratch uh, with, with uh, their work. Normally, there are existing already some um, documents, some old standards, some requirements from the health and safety side. And they, of course, doing not um, or only in, in some rare cases, according to my knowledge, and really detailed risk assessment, but they are using those starting documents and their expertise to develop the standard. But they are considering, of course, the, the major aspects uh, I have mentioned in my uh, presentation. 
Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I see that in the meanwhile, a few of the other speakers um, have been answering some questions in a written way, so that's mm -hmm. fine as well. Mm -hmm. That's why the list is a bit shorter now. Mm -hmm. Uh, how do you look for lowering working coefficients of lifting assessors in case a risk assessment has been executed in most detailed possible way? Yeah, I think this is, I'm, I'm not really an um, expert um, for, for lifting appliances or lifting accessories. Um, if this is um, justified, I think it should be accepted, but I know um, it is always difficult to come from one standard version to the next standard version with, with uh, lowered uh, values because everybody is thinking uh, you are want to reduce the, the safety at all. Uh, but I think this has to be discussed um, within the standardization group. And if it is challenged by the HAS consultant, for example, also, with the with the has consultant by by providing certain justification why this is uh, acceptable yeah? because we have also to to consider we don't live in a in a bubble um, where we could uh, have um, requirements um, exceeding and exceeding the last version we have also to compete in an international level um, and um, things have to be justified uh, by lowering or, or raising requirements uh, it doesn't matter okay i see another one can a harmonized standard set aside an essential requirement of the directive no it could not be the case because um, the, the purpose of the a uh, harmonized standard is to specify the, the essential safety requirements. And if there is no essential requirement um, with a certain uh, context, then it could not be a harmonized standard. Of course, you could develop a an, an standard um, uh, which is not addressing essential requirements or directive, but then it could not be an, an, an harmonized standard. The last one is participating to the development of some type C standards. I noticed that since the comments from my house consultants were too difficult to implement, the standard was removed from the list of harmonized standards in order to publish SAN. Uh, is this a common trend? What do you think about this position? <clears throat> yeah, I know that um, currently um, we live in a not really easy world i will say it this way i would say it this way and um, of course we have some um, potential to improve um, on the standardization side to make things uh, better on the other hand sometimes um, we have also to struggle a little bit with the consistency or the amount of of comments from the hus consultants which according to that what i have heard sometimes uh, are going beyond that what should be their uh, their task and um, in this mixture of um, of feelings i think it could happen that such a decision is made uh, of course i i'm doing this work since um, rapporteur since around about 17 years and in in my field or in my in my view I think we should try to overcome the uh, existing problems uh, to must not take those decisions because the system of um, harmonized standards in the machinery field was a rather successful one and we were always uh, mentioned as one of the uh, positive examples and I would be keen to come back to this position. The next one is how and when the user contribution and experience is collected to improve the risk assessment process. It depends um, if you could really attract the experts from the user side to participate. Of course, for them, it's not so attractive to participate, but um, I think um, the user's view could also, from my point of view, in an indirect way, 
um, really transported by the health and safety people, because at least according to the system, I know in Germany, the health and safety uh, people, they are really um, um, have, a, have a good view on the on the use of the equipment um, and, and could really channel those things. Of course, we have also the so-called Annex 3 organizations in, in, uh, in Europe, and one is the uh, organization covering the unions uh, and they could also provide their input but I know it is in, in most cases you have no people from from that field but um, it, it would be appreciated to, to have some more but I have no uh, real um, magic uh, um, um, formula to, to increase this How easy can an existing ISO standard become an ISO an EN ISO standard? Uh, this depends um, from which end you start. Uh, of course, if you start from an existing EN trying to make an uh, harmonization on, on ISO level, and this one was already accepted on, on European level uh, and um, you have not too many different views from the uh, Asian or North or South Amer American participants, then it could be more easy. Um, but of course, standardization is not a dictation from one side and you have to be open also to the history of the standardization in, in, in other regions of the world in, in ISO. And my recommendation here is really, um, you should try out first um, how much community you could really reach on uh, international level. And only if you are sure from the European side that um, you have really only a few remaining problems, then you should really go this track. Uh, and sometimes is it requires really some some uh, rounds of revising the standard in ISO um, to to have the, the right uh, content of the standard going back to to Europe. But on the other hand, I must say our European, uh, our American or Asian colleagues in the ISO TCs, they have already uh, accepted that uh, for those parallel projects, they have to deal with the HUS consultants. And we should, of course, really appreciate this, that they um, are open for this. And we, we should be careful not really to create more problems than necessary. Thank you very much, Dr. Steiger. I would like to, with this nice statement, close down the Q&A moment for your presentation. Yes, so, you. as promised to the attendees, should your question be unreplied today, we intend to make a Q&A report available for you. So, that will come later. Um, then, um, if we can just click through the next slide, because on the next slide, I would like to present you the next speaker. It is Mr. Mikhail Simonov. He is working as a policy officer uh, in DG Grow at the European Commission, and he will be talking uh, about requirements in the standards, more in particular about the specificity and the variability of these requirements. So, please, uh, Mr. Simonov, the floor is yours. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me uh follow the slides uh all uh, participants can uh, see on the screen and uh, next slide please uh basically this presentation is uh, uh, something which is not adding uh particular uh, content uh to the same guide uh, 414 but it is about uh let me say uh, how to write uh, better uh, clear um, requirements in order to meet uh, the most important criteria of so-called legal certainty when it comes to the harmonized standards published in the official journal. And consequently, let me start from semantic similarity between two apparently different terms uh, such as high quality and world class. 
So how to link uh, quality with the uh, usability, with the state of the art and uh, with the easiness of use. First of all, uh, what is needed to understand when uh, someone drafts a uh, harmonized standard is that it will be used in order to produce products going to the market in the framework of uh, uh, the legal requirements set up by the directive. Consequently, in several cases, uh, those manufacturers, they have certified quality management system, which ensures the high quality of products and services made by voluntarily using technical standards. There is no uh, obligation to use technical standards and manufacturers uh, voluntarily decides to use them because it simplifies their work. And uh, added value brought by harmonized standards, it's so called presumption of conformity. Uh, in simple words, it means that the burden of proof is inverted for commercial transactions insisting on uh, products uh, manufactured and place it on the market in the context of certified quality process. Therefore, the term quality of a standard, it's an issue of the most importance in the harmonization process, because uh, when uh, the quality is good, it's very easy to provide the presumption of conformity. So how a requirement makes a difference, uh, how it makes testable, measurable and verifiable, the qualifier high quality. Next slide, please. A standard in draft typically starts from the essential requirements uh, listed in the uh, European Union Harmonized Legal Acts, its IMSO support. Specifically for the machinery directive, it's a list of all essential health and safety requirements in the Annex 1 currently. And for each supported legal requirement, a resulting technical standard uh, shall specify measurable technical requirements. Uh, it's the first task to map legal requirements uh, by explaining how to uh, those requirements can be implemented technically. There is no obligation to support uh, all essential health and safety requirements. There is no obligation to support a specific requirement. It could be simply um, stated that it is not covered by a certain given standard, but uh, uh, if an essential health and safety requirement is supported. So if technical committee decides to support it, technically it shall be made measurable, verifiable. And typically you add uh, or people add, uh, et cetera. But et cetera, it's a qualifier that is not measurable and not verifiable. So in my presentation, I will try to explain how to avoid ATC and how to replace it by measurable and verifiable qualifiers. In all cases, the Annex Z, it's the main tool that allows verifying how the essential requirement were satisfied by the product's implementation. Consequently, consequently uh, the whole technical uh, discussion can stay in the same standard, but some requirements can be made by reference. That means no one prevents uh, making normative references to other standards. Next slide, please. Uh, graphically, there is a good uh, example in, so in the blue guide. Uh, Annex Z presents how legal requirements are technically implemented. At left side, you see uh, the list of essential health and safety requirements from the machinery uh, directive Annex 1. This is a full list. You know that uh, you restrict the list uh, to applicable only uh, uh, requirements and you obtain the list which uh, says what is covered by this standard and uh, by uh, listing in the Annex Z uh, the list of uh, clauses of the standard, you explain how each uh, clause uh, covers uh, the corresponding uh, essential requirement, which is being mapped by that clause. Uh, what is interesting in this presentation, it's a fact that uh, by writing the Annex Z, you create new entity of relationship. The relationship who makes uh, correspondence between the applicable essential requirements and the paragraphs of the text of the standard where you explain how to technically satisfy uh, one or more uh, requirements. For this reason, for this reason, this mapping, which is indicated here on my slide by the red arrow, bidirectional arrow, uh, it's a 
top most priority before uh, publishing it in the official journal, before referencing it in the official journal. Next slide, please. So how to write good enough technical specification? So this is a difficult question. And all answers, basically, you have already, because the, those are already listed in the SEN guide 414. So the SEN guide 414 contains a list of what to do. But the question is, as usual, how to do it? So how to find the right balance between being too generic, being reasonable, and being over specific. Uh, how to measure uh, the genericity and how to find the right compromise. Uh, the discipline ruling the requirements, how to write it, it's called system engineering. And there are manuals. I will show you at the end of this uh, slideshow. Next slide, please. Uh, the technical requirements uh, need to be uh, written in certain way and every requirement you decide to state to formulate it needs to meet several criteria to be considered as a good requirement and good requirements have the following characteristics first they should be unambiguous second they needs to be testable verifiable and in order to be such it requires to establish the measurability that means a criteria metrics that means tools how to uh, attribute the values uh, on the measurable attributes and the method for verification and if possible uh, to describe the tools used for testing and uh, all of those elements are known to you so there is no need to say that uh, in order to make something verifiable it needs to be measurable and we need to know what is the significance of uh, being bad, being acceptable, and being more than acceptable. So you find all of them in the state of the art. But in addition to unambiguous and verifiable, there are several other uh, requirements that need to be satisfied. That means when you write the text, you need to be as simple as possible, as precise as possible, and to use very clear writing style. So it is uh, simply uh, the style of writing. It needs to be correct. It needs to be understandable by possibly all the target audiences, but typically at least by those going to adopt your standard uh, voluntarily basis. It needs to be feasible. That means realistic and possible. And I have seen uh, one of the questions before about uh, difficult to implement or too expensive to implement. Uh, uh, the issue about the cost and benefit, it's part of the feasibility. If uh, the quality of a product is a uh, must, that means if it dominates, the cost factor are uh, subordinate to this choice. And that means they can be more expensive than usual. But in any case, uh, they need to be always realistic and possible. That means every manufacturer, small, medium, or big, needs to be able to set up the procedures in order to make verification of uh, uh, requirements. And it means uh, the implementation of uh, the verifiability and measurability of the criteria needs to be realistic. That means it needs to be not as expensive as the gold. So it should be commensurable uh, with respect to the expected price of the products and independent. And what is more important, I market it in uh, bold font, it needs to be atomic. So something which is verifiable and something which is atomic, uh, this is the main requirement uh, to be uh, testable. And then uh, requirements needs to be necessary. So, so please avoid unnecessary requirements and uh, implementation free, free. That means they should not be standards uh, describing the different possible implementations. Uh, that means uh, they need to be transferable between different manufacturers having different uh, technologies to make products. So this is a magic set, nothing special. And there are also other requirements that you can find in the literature, but all of other requirements, they can be expressed as a combination of uh, those 10 listed here.
Next slide, please. Uh, besides the criteria for individual requirements, there are three criteria that are apply, applicable to the whole set of your requirements at the end. The set needs to be consistent, it needs to be complete and not redundant. So uh, when you draft each requirement, you verify uh, the attributes of requirements indicated in the previous slide. When you finish it, your work and where you are going to release the standard, this is the final uh, verification to do, uh, giving the set of, let me say, 25 requirements. Are those consistent, not redundant and complete? And uh, if you state that uh, this is a good set of requirements, full stop. And concerning the combinations of uh, criteria, if uh, you read something uh, that uh, requirement should be modifiable, it simply means that uh, if something is atomic and not redundant, it can be modified. That means is modifiable. And traceability, it's exactly the same. To be traceable, it means it needs to have a unique ID, one, two, three, four, five, and it needs to be atomic. That means each uh, requirement needs to be uh, tested uh, in uh, an atomic conditions. That means it needs to be self-contained. Next slide, please. Uh, what happened in uh, our uh, experience? That means uh, during uh, the period of time I'm working in the machinery unit, I have seen uh, several cases of the lack of compliance. And uh, our service is always analyzing uh, for different sectors, uh, all findings uh, concerning the lack of compliance because we try to understand why they uh, appears and how to eliminate them. The most common are listed here, but just some examples. That means it's not a complete list. Otherwise I would need much more time. Uh, for example, it's uh, easily uh, read that in some candidates in some proposed standards, uh, someone is imposing obligation to the parties. That means carrying out a risk assessment is mandatory. It's not need to say it because uh, it's an obligation of the manufacturer. It is a legal obligation. It's not product technical specification. And it's unclear how to uh, perform it. That means uh, every manufacturer knows about the need to do it, but uh, by purchasing the standard and by reading it, they try to understand how to do it. That means uh, they don't want to find this sentence about uh, is mandatory. Uh, you have already a send guide for 114 and there is nothing uh, else to add to this. Then in some standards we have seen containing uh, normative clauses about uh, something which is externally influenced to a product. For example, uh, requirements for the building uh, in which uh, the product will be installed before putting the, it on the service. And again, uh, we cannot uh, deal with uh, buildings because they are covered by national legislation. And uh, the scope of uh, the standard is to support a relevant piece of the European legislation. Consequently, if you write in the scope that you are supporting the machinery directive, you are not supposed to support the building codes. And again, we are limiting uh, to the text which is written to the same guide for 114. Consequently, there is nothing else to comment. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, then we have uh, some standards uh, dealing with uh, different uh, pieces of legislation. Uh, it is not uh, uncommon to see a standard which su su standard supporting machinery and low voltage directive, for example. Uh, when someone decides to support uh, different pieces of European legislation, the writing style becomes much more complicated because uh, of the complexity of uh, the links between two pieces of legislation. So there are more complex harmonized standards with several annexes because uh, you need to ensure the consistency and uh, all requirements needs to be applicable simultaneously to two or more annexes Z. And uh, the only suggestion I can give you here is to uh, think about a special writing style and additional quality check at the end. So the 
uh, standard Z when it is written for uh, a given piece of European legislation, it's uh, one job. Another Annex Z written for the same technical standards, it's another job. But when you put them together, don't forget about the consistency. So two pieces being uh, co-present in the same standard could make inconsistent the whole. So this is the only warning. Uh, the technical committees, uh, it could happen that uh, they were not able to document how the candidate for harmonization reflects the generally acknowledged state of the art. It uh, can happen uh, when uh, we ask you to provide some additional information about this. And it would be a very good idea to put it immediately upfront uh, when you submit uh, the request for harmonization. However, however, uh, the point is the standard is not the representative of the state of the art, but it is a mirror that reflects the accumulated scientific knowledge and best engineering practice. Typically, typically, uh, this is part of the tacit knowledge. That means I never seen it uh, explicitly stated somewhere uh, until asked it. And uh, in order to uh, be able to answer this question at any stage, because it could uh, be formulated this question, the technical committee uh, shall keep trace about the concerned and used state of the art, because it could be the question uh, when there is a parameter or something else, and uh, the explanation about why this parameter is selected or why uh, and how it is uh, decided to be made verifiable. Again, now it is a question of the state of the art. So it is uh, possible to uh, ask why uh, the implementation is so difficult or so complicated uh, if uh, there are other apparently obvious alternative which are also in the state of the art. That means when someone is uh, uh, asking the information about certain uh, elements uh, of requirements, attributes of requirements, it would be appropriate to state uh, somewhere uh, from where they were taken. That means the information by stating that this parameter is selected because uh, it's part of generally as knowledge state of the art at this time. Next slide, please. And then we have uh, two generic annexes Z. And uh, now uh, the sufficient level of granularity, level of detail of annexes Z is mandatory in order to map the European legislation, and it's written in the blue guide. And uh, mapping uh, effectively, it's uh, let me say, is a good engineering practice. That means there is no uh, universal receipt explaining how to do. But uh, when a uh, technical committee is drafting the annex, that please uh, try to read at the end uh, if it is, in your opinion, granular enough. Because if uh, the user will uh, find that uh, the standard contains no verification methods, it means uh, basically that uh, any uh, verification method can be used. And because of this, verification can be uh, inappropriate or incomplete. And consequently, the arbitrary implementation uh, of a product could go to the market. And in this case, there is no minimal quality. If a proposed uh, standard contains verification by inspection, but there are no measurable indicators, uh, it's very similar thing because for you experts, it seems obvious that verification by inspection will uh, detect uh, defective elements. But don't forget that there are very different target audiences. There will be uh, big manufacturers, but there will be small, medium enterprises and startups. That means uh, not all uh, users of standard will have the same means of verification by inspection. So verification by inspection itself, it depends on the human factor. And consequently, it cannot be stated that verification by inspection is measurable. And then 
Over time, there is another aspect that uh, once a good standard is written and, uh, and uh, referenced in the official journal, uh, after a certain period of time, when it comes to the modification amendments and so on, uh, it could lose so-called referential integrity, but it's a separate question I will address in another slide. Next slide, please. So uh, what does it mean verifiable? Testers should be able to verify whether the requirement is implemented correctly. Every test should be either pass or fail. To be testable, requirement should be clear, precise, and unambiguous, and each attribute shall be miserable. Uh, first question, which procedure tester will use? And then the second question is, what number should be considered uh, many? One, 10, 100, 1,000? And what is acceptable value? threshold of range. That means what does it mean many in terms of numeric values? Next slide, please. Uh, what we are speaking is uh, an attribute of the linguistic ambiguity. Some words can make a requirement untestable. So when you write in the standard, and I have seen those words in standards, uh, adjectives such as robust, safe, accurate, effective, efficient, expandable, flexible and so on, I have no idea how to transform them in numbers. That means, what does it mean safe enough? What does it mean accurate enough? When you use adverbs and adverbial phrases, you mention frequently, quickly, safely, in timely manner. Again, uh, I don't know how to measure uh, being quick or uh, not. Uh, there are also non-specific words or acronyms. ATC, it's the most common. Uh, really, when a standard supposed to be uh, referenced in the official journal contains the term ATC, uh, this is a sufficient uh, reason to send it back by asking, please uh, do disambiguate, because uh, this is not the legal clarity. So when the standard is saying that it is incomplete to be defined, or when the standard is not specific enough by giving you the good list and then by adding ATC. So that is an indicator of the potential non-verifiability and not testability. Example, uh, the search facility should allow the user to find an item based on the name date ATC. So all search criteria should be explicitly listed in the clauses of the standard. The user is not aware about what ATC means. Next slide. Thank you. The phrasing and linguistic expressions might lead to ambiguity, unfortunately. So uh, by using the English, uh, French, German, or any other natural language, unfortunately, this is a property of the human language to be ambiguous in certain cases. When you are using modifying phrases, uh, and I, this is a list from the standards I have seen, as appropriate, as required, if necessary, shall be considered. There is no uh, help to the manufacturer because they are arbitrary. When you use vague words, when you use the passive voice, uh, in this case, it is necessary to care about possible ambiguities. That means when you write something uh, which is vague, it could happen in certain cases because you are trying to be not uh, over specific. But in all those cases, please do the lexical exercise. Try to understand uh, multiple meanings it could have. And before sending it uh, for the publication in the official journal, try to make uh, the uh, grammatical analysis because uh, when you use the passive voice, the inversion of the action uh, could be uh, surprising because the subject of the sentence receives the action of the verb rather than performing it. Consequently, when you write something in passive voice, it is necessary to uh, read it again and to understand who is the actor, what is the action, and who is the patient. That means the actor is doing something with the patient. And in this case, you need to read it again because you use it as a passive voice. That means you need to revert the sentence in active voice and then to confirm that the passive voice was correct. 
But if you are doing it, it's much better to forget about the use of passive voice and to use always the active voice. An example of requirement. The numeric code shall be entered by the user. In active voice, it would means the user actor, any user, shall enter, and this is the action input, the numeric code, and this is a patient. So uh, when you are saying that uh, the numeric code shall be entered by the user, the article the has a meaning because by reverting it to the active voice, the numeric code can be entered by any user. That means by all the users, but some of users can uh, differently input the numeric code. So in this case, when you leave it in the passive voice, you have to specify by all users and how to do it. Requirement two, the numeric code shall be entered. In this case, the question is by whom? Uh, when you omit the agent performing an action, now the question is who should enter this code, the system or the user? And in this case, when you ask the publication in the official journal, it creates uh, not a legal certainty. Next slide, please. Uh, linguistic ambiguity. It's not uh, an enemy, but it is not a good friend. That means by dealing with linguistic ambiguity, uh, simply you have to read it again and again in order to ensure that your phrasing of all linguistic expressions you have used might lead to non vagueness That means, Please try to ensure that your phrasing has only one intended meaning. When you use indefinite pronouns, and again, though this collection is coming from the uh, standards we have seen, few, many, most, much, several, any, anybody, and so on, it needs to be quantified. So what does it mean few? Is it three, five, or 20? What does it mean many? And what does it mean most? Uh, example of requirement, the system shall resist concurrent usage by many users. But uh, when I take uh, the computer, uh, I take my machine and I trying to connect and to increase the number of connection, what should I test? How many users should be simultaneously uh, attacking my machine? That means how many people can simultaneously speak with the machine and what will happen when this threshold is uh, over. So now you need to add to this requirement first, what does it mean many? And second, what should happen when uh, the number of concurrent connection exceeds that value? That means how the system should go uh, to implement the emergency stop. Should it go from the network at modality to the standalone or should it stop? Next slide, please. Uh, that was about verifiability. Now about atomicity. An atomic requirement should contain a single traceable element. That means when I am performing tests, one test means one atomic requirement. No place for and or a but. So sentences including the words and or a but should be reviewed to see if they can be broken into atomic requirement. Could happen that it cannot be broken. You leave it you leave them as is, but you explain why they cannot be broken in atomic requirements and how to perform the testing of the bundle. Example of non-atomic requirement, the system shall provide the opportunity to book the flight, one, purchase a ticket, two, reserve a hotel, three, reserve a car, and so on. That means in this example, there are five atomic requirements and the uh, traceability in this case is compromised because each of requirements insist on very different attributes of the system. Uh, I uh, use it, the examples not coming from the machinery domain because I would like to uh, avoid the, the specificity. That means what I'm saying that uh, it's in general, when you combine your requirements, please apply the requirement engineering discipline as such in uh, broader uh, meaning and nothing else. Uh, next one, please. Consistency. There should be 
not be any conflict between the requirements. The conflicts may be direct or indirect, and direct co conflicts occur when in the same situation there are different behaviors expected. For example, uh, when we speak about the dates in the European or the American standards, months, day, year, or day, month, year, it is necessary to resolve the conflict by analyzing the conditions under which uh, this requirement can take place. Uh, so when there is the ambiguity, when different implementation are possible, the good standard should indicate explicitly exact conditions under which this requirement, as it is formulated in the standard, will take place. It's not easy, but uh, this is an additional extra work to do. Next slide, please. Uh, direct conflict occurs when requirements do describe the same functionality, but it is not obvious how to fulfill both requirements at any time uh, because arbitrary solutions can be proposed. The system could be small enough, uh, the intention of the writer was uh, to limit the volume, but requirement two could be about the system to be big enough, but the intention was in length. Uh, some requirements are not commensurable or not comparable to describe the same concept, big and small. The conflict resolution techniques exist and they should be applied in this case. And uh, uh, TC shall use uh, those techniques in order to disambiguate the dependencies. That means what is dominating size or the volume, what is improving and what is worsening futures, so what should be uh dominating at what should be in suborder volume size height length and how to separate those categories by testing so how to test this situation to be small enough next slide uh, indirect conflict occurs when the requirements do not describe the same functionality but it is not possible to fulfill both requirements at the same time and in this case, uh, again, the issue is about uh, the inconsistent terminology to describe the same concept. When you will try describing it, please care about uh, the synonyms and about uh, the use of exactly the same terms used in one requirement when you move to the next requirement. That means if you have the set of requirements, the consistency between them suggests using the same th terminology. Next one, please. Non-redundant uh, set. Each requirement should be expressed only once and should not overlap with another requirement. When you set the set of requirements, the question is uh, uh, eventually to detect that in one requirement you have the subset of the second requirement. Typically, they are not repeating the same um, requirement. Uh, because you are aggregating them uh, from the list, but it could happen that uh, linguistic uh, attributes will be saying that uh, one of the requirements is overlapping with the previous one. So it's a final check. Next one. Requirements should be specified for all conditions of use that can occur. And uh, that means it is necessary to uh, specify attributes of all applicable requirements. For example, for example, you know from your life, it can happen that you discuss in the formal word about uh, the standard. And then at certain point, someone is coming by saying, I forgot to mention that. And in this case, you have to reopen the question and to review it. So before uh, releasing the standard, please check that all conditions of use that can occur, they are considered by uh, the standard. So don't forget that uh, the measurable attributes could vary by varying the conditions of use. Next slide, please. Uh, there is a good instrument, and probably you are aware about it. It's uh, called the requirement verification matrix. Uh, usually it is presented in graphical form, but it could be also described uh, analytically by using the plain text. In this case, uh, you need to uh, simply uh, put together uh, the unique ID of a requirement, 
how to satisfy it, which verification method should be used, and timing uh, when it should be verified. And then concerning the verification methods, again, is, there are different methods, analysis, inspection, demonstration, testing, certification, and so on. Next slide, please. System verification by inspection typically includes the use of human senses, and those uh, are uh, good, but uh, not uh, optimal for uh, digital technology. That means it's uh, not very replicable in all, uh, in different uh, manufacturing processes. System analysis method may be used when other verification methods are not possible because uh, too expensive because uh, not, uh, not reliable and so on. And then the last one is the measure based method, which appears to be the better solution. The metrics can be based on uh, mathematical models, simulations, algorithms, calculations, chart, graphs, uh, state of the art, and so on. And uh, because of this, please think when you are uh, declaring the verification method. Uh, why this method should be privileged. That means nowhere I have seen the explanation why certain um, method of verification was proposed. Next slide. Uh, referential integrity is the last uh, topic uh, to handle in my presentation because typically you release the standard at the time zero and uh, you fix all the requirements and apparently they are atomic, is consistent, and some requirements can be made by reference to other standards. Uh, an example is multi-part uh, set of standards. Uh, in this case, uh, when uh, the standard A is supposed to be used in conjunction with the part B, what is necessary to ensure that the reference uh, having the temporal validity, it's valid over all the time the pair of two standards A and B coexist. The requirement might become inconsistent when you amend the father standard A, because it could change something uh, inherited by the child B. And the referential integrity, it's a phenomenon uh, which refers to the validity of the links over time. That means there are no children without the father. When you decide that the standard A and standard B are paired and the relationship is uh, super class and uh, uh, more specific uh, class, uh, that means uh, type A and type C standard, this relationship is forever. When it is established, both father and child should be living together. It's not possible to change the father or to kill the father because the orphaned child number two will suffer. So it needs to be reattributed to someone else. Consequently, when you take the good standard and when you evolve over time by thinking and by applying an amendment, think about the possible children connected to this standard. That means when you have the standard with normative references to other standards, when you start analyzing and changing that standard, please care about the validity of links over time. An example, withdrawal of a standard A at time two or replacing a standard A by other standard at time three, it can destroy the references which were formerly valid when both standards were referenced in the official journal. And this is a peculiarity of evolutionary uh, maintenance of the stock of the standards. Next slide, please. Okay, now I would like to stop because all the rest is uh, about internal regulation. So there is nothing I told you which is new because all elements mentioned now, there are somewhere written in the document ER3. Next slide, please. Conclusions. Uh, if you believe that uh, my speech is useful because I touched something which is important, there are books. Uh, any book on requirement engineering is good. That means it's uh, plenty of possible reading. Some of them are uh, to be purchased. Some of them are available online for free somewhere. Take any book and to read it. That means always start mapping exercise when you start drafting uh, the candidate for harmonization 
from the essential requirements by saying why I'm doing this mapping, what will be supported, that means which set of essential requirements will be technically developed by this text, and how I will be mapping those requirements. When you write, please care about linguistic ambiguity. Each word, ideally, has to have one meaning only. If there are several meanings, please do comment, please do disambiguate, please try to eliminate those uh, sentences. When you uh, specify how to define that the product is good, think about well-defined metrics and measurement methods. Uh, when you are writing the text, please try to privilege the active voice. Who, noun phrase, means actor, who is doing the action. Is doing, it's a verbal phrase, Action should be repeatable by any manufacturer in any context. And what? What you are measuring. Thank you very much.